These volcanoes have a wide variety of shapes. However, we can identify two major types, cones and domes. Puy de Dome is the highest and most well known. Its 1,464 meter peak dominates the entire chain. The Gauls and later the Romans built temples at the volcano's summit. The Roman temple was dedicated to Mercury, otherwise known as Dumias, from which the mountain's current name is derived. It was at the Puy de Dome that in 1648, Blaise Pascal demonstrated the weight of air by comparing the height of a column of mercury at the volcano's peak with that of a column at the bottom at Clermont-Ferrand. The Puy chain contains only eight domes. Strombolian type cones are the most common. Puy de Combe is one of the most remarkable. What makes it special is that it has two craters, one inside the other. As for Puy de Paris, it is sometimes considered the Vesuvius of the Auvergne region. It made a great impression on Leopold von Buch, the most renowned geologist of the 19th century. Because of its elegant silhouette, he considered it the model volcano. In fact, von Buch was totally enthralled by the Auvergne Mountains and went so far as to write, If you want to see volcanoes, choose Clermont-Ferrand rather than Etna or Vesuvius. Regardless of what Van Buch said, the grapes of Lacrima Christi still ripen in the Bay of Naples' sun, as they have for 20 centuries, and the great volcano on which they thrive still attracts more tourists than any other in the world. Vesuvius' renown is inextricably linked to the fate of the people who lived here in the year 79 AD. They suddenly saw the familiar hilltop start smoking, and within minutes, it was spewing tons of burning cinders over them. The Roman writer Pliny the Younger later described these hellish moments in a letter to Tacitus. It gives us an exact and moving eyewitness account and is the first written document on volcanology. Cinders began falling on us, though in small quantities. I turned and saw a thick black fog threatening to overtake us, following us like a torrent spreading across the ground. Let's make a detour, I said, while we can still see, for fear of being knocked down in the road and crushed in the shadows by the crowd of those fleeing with us. We were barely seated when the sky went dark. Not the darkness of a moonless night in cloudy weather, but the darkness of a closed room in which all lights have been extinguished. We heard women moaning, babies wailing and men shouting. Some were calling out to their fathers and mothers. Others called out to their children or their spouses. Some were lamenting their own bad fortune. Others lamented that of their king. A few, fearing death, prayed for it to take them. Many raised their arms to the gods, and more than one among them cried that there were no gods in heaven that this eternal night would be the world's last. The eruption lasted three days and killed thousands. Life stopped at Pompeii for centuries to come. It was more than 1,500 years later before the first trace of the city was at last discovered, and it would be another 200 before the excavations began. When Pompeii was at last liberated from its cinder shroud, the city was revealed as it once was, a pleasant and lively city center stretching over one square kilometer where some 20,000 people had lived. <laughs> 